us all the way from beautiful Boulder, Colorado, where he serves as director of the Aquinas Institute for Catholic Thought. He is also a teacher, speaker, theologian, and author, as well as host of a weekly podcast called The Word on the Hill with the Lanky Guys. And it's through this podcast that I have come to really appreciate his work. He is a limitless well of knowledge on scripture and theology, a powerful witness of love and outreach to his community at the University of Colorado, and a brilliant but humble man who draws the truths of scripture into the struggles and victories of daily life. But here in Hamilton, we know him best as the source of most of Father Marcus's homily material. <laughs> and he is here to speak to us tonight about discipleship and the end of the age. He grew up in Mexico City in the early 1900s, and he lived and grew up in what would become one of the darkest times for the Catholic Church in Mexico, when it was about to face incredible, fierce, bloody persecution. Uh, but he fell in love with his Catholic faith, and he decided he wanted to be a priest, and he decided to be a Jesuit. And he was, he, he was ordained for the priesthood in Belgium, I believe, and he became a priest in 1925, I think. And right after becoming a priest and being ordained, he got incredibly ill. He was very sick. And his order decided it would be best to send him back home to Mexico City, where a violent persecution of Catholics was erupting at the time. But they thought, well, he's too sick, so he'll be safe because he'll kind of be in front of him and just stay in bed, so he'll be fine. 
So he got back to Mexico, I think it was 1926, and within 23 months, the persecution hit its highest level. The president of Mexico made it completely illegal to have any kind of public worship. But that didn't stop Justin Miguel Pro, who was still sick, and still recovering from his infirmity, but he decided to go undercover. This would make such a good movie, you guys. Somebody needs to make it. Because he went undercover, and no one knew him as a priest because he was ordained in Belgium and just flew back. So he was unknown, so he was able to go undercover and offer the sacrament. So he would tell these stories. He would go to like big office buildings and he would dress in like his three-piece suit to go undercover. Or, you know, go as dressed as a street person or a door-to-door -door salesman. He would don all these disguises, dressed as a homeless person in the park, and he would say mass and cognito and offer confession and on the slide to give people the sacraments. It was incredible. And I love it because my son is enamored with, with costumes. He just loves costumes. I watch it. Oh, it was yesterday. I think it was yesterday. And this is almost every day. My son doesn't sleep very well, um, which is its own. It's own. He struggles with autism, and part of it is um, sleep is a big struggle for him. So he's usually up at 4 or 5 in the morning most mornings. But I rolled out of bed on Monday, I think it was. It was really poor. It's about this temperature back in Colorado. And I rolled out of bed at 6 a.m., and I turned on the coffee. And I looked out the front window, and I saw this kid biking down the street in nothing but a bathrobe, a long black wig down to his back, and a top hat. And I was like, that's the whole <laughs> He just loves his costumes. And so I, I love telling him about Les and Miguel Pro, who actually used this um, disguise. I mean, come on, it was a priest in disguise, going all over town, it was incredible. But slowly the government caught wind of it, and they knew that someone was out there doing some sort of public worship, which was illegal, and he was offering sacraments, and he was saying mass, and the government did not like being undermined. And they found out who it was, but they couldn't get him. He was always kind of slipping out of their grasp. Eventually, um, during a presidential procession, when the president was, was uh, his motorcade was traveling through, someone threw uh, a little homemade bomb and actually tried to assassinate him. It didn't work, but the government decided to frame Miguel Pro and his brothers for it. They're like, this is how we're going to do it. And we're going to frame him for this crime. And they found him, and they arrested him. And they brought him to stand trial, and he was found guilty of publicly worshiping. And what they tried to do, this was remarkable for the time, again, this is, this is mid-1920s. They wanted his execution by firing squad to go viral. It was one of the first accounts of some attempted virility. I don't know if virality is a word, but they wanted to go viral, so they brought together the, the newspaper reporters from all the newspapers to take photographs of the moment that he was executed so that they could slap it on all the front pages of all the papers around Mexico to warn anyone else who dare stand up against the government and do something like this. And they're like, we're going to capture it, we're going to scare everybody, and we're going to use this guy's death for our benefit. And so they brought him out to the firing squad. He refused the blindfold because he wanted to look at his executors as they were killing him. And as he came out and he went before the firing squad, he opened his hands, and one hand was a crucifix, and the other hand unfurled a rosary. And before they fired the guns, he yelled out, Viva Cristo Rey! Does anyone know what that means? Long live Christ the King. And they shot him, and he was killed, and he died. And they caught the photograph, and they put it on all the front pages of all the newspapers, expecting that everyone would cower in fear because of this. But guess what happened? Precisely the opposite. And instead of making people afraid, they started to say, wow, that guy actually stood up for his beliefs. He loves his Catholic faith, just like I do, and I'm so afraid. But he wasn't afraid. He stood up, and he went to his death courageously. He didn't cower in a blindfold. He faced his captors because he seemed to have known that there was more to the world than what it seemed. Which is why I start with that story. Because there's a lot more to the world than what it seems. The world is not as it seems. And I want to spend this evening trying to convince you of that. That everything we know and experience and see and hear and taste and touch is different than reality. And in a lot of ways, our senses are deceiving us. Our social media is deceiving us. Our governments are deceiving us. The world around us is not as it seems. So how do I want to do that? Well, I want to start by doing what Jesus liked to do when he taught. And Jesus, when he taught, would often like to go back to the beginning. He does that a lot. He says, in the beginning, this is how it was supposed to be. So let's go back to the beginning for a second. Let's do Theology 101. I love to teach the Bible. That's actually my great love. That's where I spend most of my time. And does anybody know 
what the first four words of the Bible are? I know it feels weird to talk in church, but I'm doing it, so there's only you guys can do that too. What are the first four words of the Bible? You can say it. In the beginning, God. God what? Well, God created the heavens and the earth. God will make everything that is light from dark, sea from sky, all of those things. But those first four words are actually what I want to pause on because we tend to read right past it into what God does. But in the beginning, God doesn't say there was a God or God was made or created God. It just says in the beginning, God. God is. He is eternal presence, eternal existence. So who is the God? The God that we believe in. The God that we worship in this place. The God that we receive at Mass. The God that we worshiped on the altars an hour ago. The God that we profess as Catholics is a God that we believe is so real and so tangible and so present that we say that the very word that God speaks is actually another person. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. We call him the Word of God. But just as the words that come out of my mouth are not totally separate from who I am, so too the Word that God speaks is not separate from who he is. Right? God the Father and his Word, God the Son, and the love relationship between God the Father and God the Son, the church has always taught, is also so real and so tangible and so present that it too is another person called the Holy Spirit. So, what is God? Who is God who is at the beginning? Well, the God that we believe in and we profess as Catholics is a God who at the root of God is relationship. Right? God the Father, loving from all eternity, God the Son, God the Son from all eternity, receiving the love of the Father, pouring it back to Him, and the love between God the Father and God the Son being so real that it's actually another person called the Holy Spirit. That's the God who is. That's the God who creates the heavens and the earth and the light and the dark and the dinosaurs and, you know, every, everything else that we have. God who is relationship. A God who is family. The church teaches fundamentally God is communion. Which is actually really cool. And I know you know this, but I know this is kind of simple theology, but it bears reflecting on it. Because it's been said that you and I were created out of relationship because God is relationship. We're created from relationship for relationship. We're made for relationship. And so if we're still in the beginning, from those first lines of Genesis, in the beginning God, the God what? God created. The heavens and the earth, the light and the dark. The capstone of God's creation, we're told, is human beings. It's us. We are the icing on the cake, so to speak. In the beginning, I first heard this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think Sarah talked about Father ripping off you know, stuff from the podcast, which is great. I'm going to rip off the story of the Bishop, because that's a good story. So I'm going to move with this, change this. Um, but what I'm about to share with you is something that I ripped off from another priest who taught me this principle that comes from the catechism. Well, it comes from Genesis. And the principle I'm about to share with you is articulated in the catechism of the Catholic Church, this great compendium of all the Catholic teachings. Um, and when I first heard it, it changed everything for me. It changed the whole way. I, I, I was raised... I was one of those kind of Christmas and Easter Catholics. But we were Catholic, we went to church. It was kind of a cultural thing. I'm sure we went more than that, but it didn't really mean that much to me. It was just kind of a thing we did. And it wasn't really until high school and in college that my eyes were open and I realized what this thing was that I had been going through the motions of. And part of what made everything make sense to me is a principle that this priest shared with me. And I've taken it on the four harmonies, or the four relationships, but the idea is this. And again, I didn't make this up. This is in Genesis, for Pete's sake. But the church expresses it in a very beautiful way. So in the beginning, when you and I were made, when human beings were made, when our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, were made, human beings were created, remember, out of relationship for relationship. So we were made, we were designed, we were built for four specific relationships. Really specific. Look there. We were created, number one, first and foremost, to be in a relationship with God, right? God is relationship. How do we relate to him? By being in a relationship. That's, that's good. That's what we do. We're meant to be in a relationship with God, which I know we say that, and we're supposed to say stuff like that, I'm a Catholic speaker, so of course I say that, but it's really hard. If I'm being totally honest with you, I'm totally frank with you. I try to have a prayer life, and I do. I do my prayers every day, but it's really hard. For any of you who have actually taken prayer seriously for any length of time, and try to devote yourselves to it, you know how hard it is to try to build a relationship with someone 
who my physical ears doesn't hear talking back to me. I don't hear that response. I know that I feel it in different ways and God manifests himself, but it's hard sometimes to actually build a prayer life with a God that I can't see and hear in my ears. I can have a relationship with my friends, with my wife, with my kids, because I interact with them. But it's harder, because God places a bit of a veil over himself, doesn't he? Prayer life is hard, but we are meant for it, and we will not be happy in this life without it, without that relationship. So we're made for a relationship with God, that's number one. We're made for a relationship with ourselves, that's number two. Which sounds weird, but all we mean by that is the concept of holiness. We're made to be holy. We're made to do what is good for us. I mean, how many times in a day, I, this is such a lousy example, you guys, but I did it yesterday. I have had this hankering. Oh, this is embarrassing. I'm going to do it again. I'm in church. It's okay. I have had this hankering for the last two weeks for peanut butter m &Ms. You guys ever had peanut butter m &Ms? Not peanut m &Ms. Those can stay over there. Peanut butter m &Ms, which, in my opinion, are mind-blowing. But here's the thing. I'm slightly allergic to peanuts. <laughs> not that severely. I'm not anaphylactic or anything like that. But they kind of mess me up. But yet... I love peanut butter m ms inexplicably. They are euphoric when I eat them. I don't know why. And so I bought a giant party-sized bag of them yesterday. And I was kind of stressed out. I was in a bit of a bad mood. I had all these things to do. And I bought this bag. And I just started chowing down. And of course what happens? I had the worst stomach ache ever. And I couldn't sleep the night before. Because I ate these things in a bad mood. That does not make any sense. And it's, I know it's a, a, a tame, kind of a lame example of the fact that human beings constantly do and choose things that are bad for us, right? That's m &Ms. But think of the real, you know, the weighty things, the moral things that we do that we know we shouldn't do, but we do them anyway. That's bizarre. No other creature on Earth does stuff like that. They follow instinct. And if it's not good for them, they tend not to do it. We do what's right for us, except for us. We don't. That's bizarre, and I just want to point out to you how bizarre that actually is if you sit down and think about it. And again, from stupid things like m &Ms to big things like the great sins that we find ourselves confessing over and over in confession, it's weird that we can't ever seem to be the people that we want to be, or that we know we're supposed to. But that's not how it's supposed to be. Again, going back to the beginning, we were designed to be in a relationship with ourselves. Because we're in a relationship with God, we're meant to be whole. We're meant to be the people that we're designed to be. That's how we were made. Number three, we were meant to be in relationship with the people around us. We're not made for war. We're not made for strife. You guys have an election coming up in like two weeks. And I'm sorry. I, I love, love you guys. I don't know most of you, but I love you. It's brothers and sisters in Christ. And I know that your politics are ugly up here, and I know this election cycle has been particularly ugly for you guys. I live in the United States of America. I don't know if you've heard about it down there. <laughs> but just, it's even that, it's a, it's a weird example, but we can't get along with each other. We can't coexist in the same society. We, we fight for each other's throats. There's a war that just started in, in, uh, overseas this morning. I mean, the world's a disaster. We are constantly in strife with one another. But in the beginning, it wasn't so. We were made for that. We were meant to be in relationship with the people around us. And number four is a relationship with God, relationship with ourselves, relationship with the people around us. And then number four, we were meant to be in a relationship with the rest of creation, with the earth that God gave us. And I don't know about you, I, I, um, aside from my work at the University of Colorado, my wife and I direct a ministry called Camp Waitiwa. And our whole pedagogy is taking young people, high school, middle school students, university students, into the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, going backpacking, wet river rafting, rock climbing, and teaching young people about themselves and about their Catholic faith through those experiences. But those experiences are hard. Nature is weird, you guys, right? Natural disasters, weather pattern, it's, it was 80 degree at dawn. It was really warm when I left Colorado. It was warm, <laughs> super nice in short weather. And I'm supposed to land tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And it's going to be freezing cold and snow. That's weird, right? It's just nature's weird, creation's strange. Again, we're the only creatures, have you ever thought about this? We're the only creatures on Earth that don't ever really feel at home in the world that is our home. 
You ever think about that? We can't ever figure it out. It's either too hot or it's too cold or we're too sweaty or we're annoyed by something or there's a natural disaster we don't understand or creation is unpredictable and it's weird and it's just threatening and we're kind of freaked out by it. But that's not the way it was supposed to be. In the beginning, we were meant to be in a relationship. So there's four things. Being in a relationship with God, a relationship with ourselves, personal holiness, a relationship with the people around us, a relationship with the earth that God gave us. That's how we were designed. And if you read the story of humanity being created in Genesis, that's how it was. It was good. And the God who is, and the God who created us for a relationship and loved us, said to our first ancestors, this is the world after you. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Enjoy. Just trust me on this one thing. Will you trust me here? But you know, original sin, it's not really about the fruit. Do you guys know what the original sin was? <laughs> what was it? What was the sin? I think pride was involved. But the catechism the Catholic Church gives us a very um, specific answer. You know, you say it. Trust, exactly right. Now, pride, I think, is a factor. I think fear was a factor. There's all sorts of things about human beings that factor into this. But the Catechism says, no, no, what the first sin was, was man let his trust in his Creator die in his heart. God said, I love you. I want you to thrive and be happy. Just trust me. And humanity said, we will not trust you. Whether out of pride or out of fear, because of whatever the serpent was, or whatever mix of it, we could not trust God. Because we thought God was keeping something. He was holding out. There was something more. And he was trying to keep us down. And so our first ancestors did not trust God. They did what he asked them not to. He did, they did not turn into him. And because we broke that first relationship, what's the first relationship before? Us and God. And that was fundamental, you guys. They're not co equals Because we are in relationship with God, everything else in our life makes sense. But once our first ancestors broke trust with God... Everything falls apart. You guys know the story, right? As soon as Adam and Eve eat the fruit, what's the first thing that happens? They realize. Which is, again, it's really not about the nakedness. It's about that now there is something about me that I'm really uncomfortable with. I am ashamed of myself. Internally, there's a brokenness. And not only am I internally ashamed of myself, but simultaneously I'm ashamed of myself because I actually don't trust you either. And there's this moment, probably, that Adam realizes, wow, I can look at Eve in a way that I probably shouldn't be looking at Eve. And if I can do that to her, maybe she can do it back to me. Oh, I don't want her to do that to me. I better cover up, because I don't know if I trust you anymore. So internally, we're broken. Externally, we break down. We don't trust each other. And then eventually, once God gives the punishment for this disobedience, he says to Adam, you know what, Adam, because you've done this, because you used creation to actually distrust me, now all of creation is actually going to oppose you. Creation is going to be a weird, kind of frightening, and unpredictable, and unrelenting place. It's going to be a, out of a relationship out of life. So think about this for a second. We, we know the story, right? I'm not telling you anything you probably haven't heard before in Sunday school. But imagine a world, try to imagine what a world would look like where we didn't always trust God, where we made really bad decisions and we felt shame about ourselves where we don't trust the people around us, and where the created world that God gave us just does not make sense. Does that sound familiar? I know it's a stretch in your imagination. Let me say it again in case you missed it. Imagine a world where you don't always trust God, where you make bad decisions, and we feel ashamed about ourselves, we fight with the people around us, we don't trust people, and the created world that God gave us, it's just scary and unpredictable and weird and uncomfortable. Is that the world we live in? That sounds like a really broken world, doesn't it? Do we live in a broken world? You guys see the news, you guys know what's going on. Do we live in a broken world? Yes. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But honestly, if you take nothing else away from this talk whatsoever, please take this. We do not live in a broken world. You guys, I'm going to give you the heart of Christianity. This is all of it. We do not live in a broken world. We live in a broken but redeemed world, which is a very big difference. And too often, I think, especially those of us who are Catholics and are Christian, we act like the world is broken. 
or hopeless, or even worse, we, have, we look at the evil in the world, we look at all the sin, all the corruption, all the chaos out there, and we act like we don't know the end of the story. I don't know if evil's going to win or not. Is good going to win? Is evil going to win? We don't know what's going to happen here. Don't we? We act like that. Like we don't know what's going to end, what's going to win in the end. Which is the most unchristian thing that we could possibly do. What is Christianity? Christianity is the belief that God became a human being to fix the broken relationship between human beings and God. Let's say it again. God became a human being to fix the broken relationship between human beings and God. That's what Christianity is, isn't it? God became incarnate. He, he literally gave himself to us to fix the broken relationship between human beings and God. And if that first relationship between humanity and God, broken by Adam and Eve, is foundational for everything else in our life, then what does it mean that Christ has restored? Well, it means, as the church tells us, that guess what? If that's true, and I believe it's true, if that's true, then I can actually be the person that I want to be. I don't have to be a slave to my own house anymore. That's a person. <laughs> but I don't have to be a slave to my weaknesses, right? I can be the husband that I want to be to my wife. I can be the father I want to be. I can be holy. I told you the story of Blessed Miguel Fro because our faith tradition has these giants that we hold up and they're like, see, they did it. They got this. We can be the people we're called to be. We can be saints. We can be in relationship with the people around us. We don't have to cower in fear of one another. We don't have to live on social media reading comments about things like we're looking at a car accident. We don't have to be slaves to those things either. We can actually live, again, I can be a, 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 a husband to my wife who's loving. I get, she gets on my, I get on her nerves. She's never gotten on my nerves. But I know I get on her nerves. And I know my kids get on my nerves. But I can actually overcome those things with the help of Jesus Christ, I can actually be a good father. I can be a good husband. I can be a good friend. Those things are actually attainable because of what Jesus did. And I can actually understand what it means to be a human being in this beautiful world that God gave us. We were stuck in traffic for like two and a half hours coming from the Toronto airport today. Which was, it was long. We were sitting there and it was, you know, we're just stuck in traffic. I know we like being stuck in traffic. But there was one moment that I actually took the time to look up I was like, oh my gosh, the leaves and the trees are utterly beautiful. And what a gorgeous day it is. Maybe it's not so bad. Like, we can actually open our eyes and realize, oh my God, it was a beautiful world we live in, didn't we? I know it's confusing, and sometimes we're too hot and too cold, but whatever. But we can actually learn to live in this place that He gave us. This is the secret to all of Christianity, you guys. Jesus came to restore our relationship with God so that we can be holy. So that we can be in a relationship with one another. So that we can understand what it means to be in this world that he gave us. That's the Christian faith. But to do that, to do that suggests that we have to look beyond what we can merely see with our eyes. Because, well, here's the thing. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you one more thing. I want to be careful with my time. And I, don't, I get off on tangents and do that. And I don't have notes in front of me, but there's no difference. There's a concept that I just want to mention to you because this is, I mention it because this is the title of the talk. But in Jesus' time, when Jesus lived and actually did ministry and walked as a Palestinian Jew, there was a concept that was pretty widely and universally understood about the way the world worked. And the ancient Jews thought of the world in terms of two ages. Two ages. And actually called it that, the two ages. Jesus uses that language, actually. But the idea was this. There is the old age. So when Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve committed their sin against God, when they broke trust, what do we call that sometimes? What do we call that first human act of disobedience? We have two names that we give it. We call it original sin. It's one of them. That's a big one. But we also call it the fall. And I like the fall. I don't like the fall, but I like the term. Because it says something, and, and what the Jewish people believed was this. Human beings were created to basically live at a pretty high level of existence. To live in relationship with God, with themselves, with the people around us, with the world. We were created to live with this high dignity. But that original act of sin made us drop in our sort of state of existence. We didn't lessen our dignity, but we sure act like we do. 
and we took a fall. We took a nose down. And the ancients talked about that moment as the moment that ushered in the age of sin, or the age of death, or the old age. Sometimes Jesus and Paul call it the present age, this age. The age that's defined by sin, and war, and death, and chaos, and fighting, and confusion. Which sounds familiar to us, but here's the catch. Everyone believed, again, this is the Jewish theologians of Jesus' time, everyone believed, even though we live in this state of chaos and sin, someday, someday, God's going to come back. Nobody knew how it was going to happen. But they believe that someday God's going to come back. He's going to step back into history, and he's going to set things right. Things are a mess. Sin is raining. Someday God's going to come, and he's going to fix it. So the bad guys that way vindicate the good guys. And they talked about that moment as the ushering of the new age. Or sometimes they call it the age to come. You guys remember when Jesus uses this language? The rulers of this age, that's Paul, lorded over them. But in the age to come, this thing's going to happen. Does that make sense? Two ages. That's how they thought about the world. The age of death and sin and chaos that Adam and Eve ushered in. But this future day that they believed God would step into time and fix everything. And usher in an age of forgiveness. An age of a kind of uh, 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 resurrection. And we would kind of come back to life. War would be no more. Strength would end. Sin and chaos would be gone. The age to come. So here's my question to you. Does that make sense, that paradigm? So my question is, which age do we live in? I can wait. I got to wait tomorrow. I'll wait tomorrow. Which age do we live in? It's kind of a hard question, isn't it? Do we live in the present age of sin and corruption and death and chaos? Or do we live in the age to come of reconciliation and forgiveness and resurrection and chaos being gone. Which one do we live in? I'm happy with your confusion. No, I'm not happy with it, but it's, it's appropriate. Because what happened was this. Here's what no one expected. All of the theologians and, and rabbinical thinkers of Jesus' time thought that this was kind of going to happen in one fell swoop, right? God would come in, he would fix it, and it would be a done deal. But nobody expected precisely what Jesus actually did. So the answer to the question, which age do we live in, is both. No one expected that there would be an overlap of the two ages. And we, for better or for worse, live smack in the middle. Because we know, and this is where the whole point of my talk comes in, Jesus is risen from the dead. That's real, that's true, and if that's true, that means that he has brought us back to life. Paul calls it a down payment of the good things that are coming. But that means when we're baptized, when we receive the Eucharist, when we engage in the sacraments, we're literally living the, age, the life of the age to come. Sin has been defeated. Death has been conquered. But how can that be? Because I'm still going to die someday. I still struggle with sin. I still fall to the same things that I fell to yesterday and last week. How can that possibly be, right? And this is what the Christian theologians had to dig out. And say, well, wait a second. Yeah, we live in the middle where all of the trappings of the old age are still present. It still feels like that. I'm still afraid of everything. I still fear war and strife and my own sin and all the rest of it. But the reality is that Christ has actually conquered those things. If you want the key, the reading key, to unlocking the whole New Testament, actually all of Paul's letters are really about this, is about Paul making the argument that the world is not what it seems. I don't know if this makes sense. Um, I'm assuming most of you are Catholic, you might not all be Catholic, but for those of you that are, every Sunday or every day, we are coming to the daily events. Um, well, no, let's talk about this. Uh, most of you, many of you, were here for Adoration just a little bit ago. And up on the altar, a little over an hour ago, I'm not lying, it's good. There was this big gold vessel that had this bright white thing inside it. And that bright white thing, if you tasted it, it tastes like bread. It's 
smells like bread, it feels like bread, you crack it, it crumbles like bread. If you look at it under a microscope, it has all of the, the, the um, accidentals of bread. But yet, our faith is saying, I know what all your senses are telling you, I know what your sense of taste and smell and touch are telling you, but those things are all lying to you. Every time you go to Mass, you receive something. Father says, the body of Christ. And you receive this thing that tastes like bread, that looks like bread, that smells like bread, that feels like bread. And when you say amen, what you're essentially saying is, yeah, but I know that's not true. You are essentially suspending all of your senses to say, yeah, they're actually deceiving me. My senses are incorrect. Because that thing that looks and tastes and smells like bread is actually not. It's the Lord of the universe. Which is a very hard teaching of the Catholic Church. So those of us who actually may have or have the grace to believe that, to say, yeah, no, I, I can believe that. That's what our church is asking us to do with everything else in your life as well. When a little voice in your ear says, you're a slave to that sin and you always will be. No, my senses are deceiving me. That voice is not telling the truth. You're not as pretty as you should be. You're not nearly as strong as you should be. You're lame. You stink at that thing. You're not enough. You're not a man. You're not a woman. All of those things are actually deceiving you. Because you live in a world where Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and conquered death and has destroyed sin. And the only power, the only power the evil one has in your life is to whisper lies to your ear. That's it. He doesn't have any magic spells he can put over you. The only power is to whisper lies in your ear. And his power grows simply when we believe the lies. But if we're willing to take the big leap of faith, we say, no, that's not true. I know who I am. I'm created in the image and likeness of God. I do dumb things sometimes, but I've gotten back up, and I know who I am. That's living the life of the age to come. Okay. Discipleship was the other word that was in the title. Here's how I want to kind of close our time today. Um, but here's how I want to close. Because this merits is so what, I think. Like, that's cool, and I think that makes some sense, and hopefully this is clear. Because, again, i got to tell you guys, when I was first introduced to those two concepts, the four relationships and the two ages, that was the first thing that made Catholicism make sense to me. That I said, oh, I can actually live that now that that's been acknowledged. You know, it doesn't seem like that's the case, but I believe that it is. So here's how I want to end. There's a story, my favorite story in the Bible, which is a big statement, but I think it's true. My favorite story in the Bible comes from the Gospel of Luke. Does anyone have a Bible? If you have a Bible, break it out. If you don't, don't worry about it. But I'm going to talk about a story that happens at the very end of the Gospel of Luke. It's in Luke chapter 24. I'm going to start in verse 13. It's the story of the road to Emmaus, which you've probably heard millions, millions of times. It's read in Mass every couple of years. It shows up periodically. There's been a million talks given about this uh, story. But I want to try to do something new with it. Maybe you've never heard it before, which is even better for me. But it says this. This is in chapter 24, verse 13. The very end of the Gospel. It says that very day. Two of them, two disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. It says that very day. Does anyone have any idea what very day that he's talking about? The day of the resurrection. The day of the resurrection. It's Easter Sunday. But it's not just any Easter Sunday. It's the Easter Sunday, the first one. And this moment, you guys, I'm convinced this is one of the most interesting moments in all of human history. Because this is the moment that Jesus has risen from the dead. But nobody knows about it. How fascinating, right? Jesus has defeated sin and death and risen from the grave, and nobody knows. So what does Jesus do in that time? He messes with people. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is the God of All right. So there's these two disciples on Easter Sunday, the Easter Sunday, who are walking seven miles to a village in Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. The, the crucifixion, the passion, the disciples running and hiding, all the craziness that's just taking place. It says, verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, actually in Greek it says while they were bickering and fighting with each other. 
which is kind of funny, the, the English softens it. Now they're bickering. Because it's been a stressful weekend, right? There's been a lot of stuff happening. So while they were bickering with each other, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Their eyes were dark. On the first day of the week, we just talked about creation, right? Remember what God did on the first day of creation? No, the first day. Back in Genesis, what did he do on the first day of creation? Separated light from darkness. So if you're Jew, the symbolism of the first day of the week, the symbolism of Sunday, always has to do with light and dark. And on this particular Sunday, there's two people that are described as being in darkness. Their eyes are dark. But Jesus is there. But they can't, they don't know who it is. They've been, who knows how long they've been following him. They've been disciples, they've been going after him. I don't know for how long, but they can't see him. They don't understand who it is. Verse 17. And he said to them, what are you fighting about? <laughs> what are you bickering about with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, who was named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem that does not know the things that have happened there these days? Let me say that again. They're walking away from Jerusalem, seven miles, it's Easter Sunday. Jesus shows up. Is got nothing better? I, 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 no, this is the best thing you can do. Sorry, I'm not trying to explain it. Jesus shows up, and he's like, hey, what are you guys talking about? Can you picture it? I don't, I don't, it's my mind, but in my mind, he's just like, what are you guys talking about? What are you doing? And I'm like, what, who are you? He was the one. And they're annoyed. He said, what are you talking about? You're fighting, huh? Are you bickering? Are you bickering? What about? Which, I don't know, I don't know. But they're like, are you, seriously, dude, are you the only one who doesn't know what just happened? What are we talking about? And what's the irony of that statement? He's literally the only person on earth who knows what has happened there in these days. Which I bet Luke is loving right now. He's like, oh my god, this is gonna kill him. So, but they stood still and looked at What do we know about these two so far? We know they're disciples. We know that they're going to Emmaus, which is seven miles outside of Jerusalem. We know one of them is named Cleopas, right? One of them is named Cleopas. Do we know anything about the other one? Well, not from the text. There's a principle that I love. And the principle says, oftentimes, oftentimes when there's something in the Bible that doesn't make sense, there's an answer for it somewhere else in the Bible. The Bible loves to interpret itself. So on Easter Sunday, you have a story about a guy named Cleopas who's walking home, or at least the place that he's staying. With whom? We don't know. Unless you read the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, Remember on Good Friday when Jesus is being crucified? John tells you, he names for you all the people that were there at the crucifixion. Remember who was there? We got Mary, the Blessed Mother, was there. Mary Magdalene was there. John himself was there. One other person. Anyone remember? Someone named Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Hmm. Isn't that coincidental? So on Friday, there's somebody at the cross named Mary, the wife of Cleopas, or Clopas, which is the Aramaic version of Cleopas, and Luke's writing in a different language. So on Friday, there's someone named Mary, the wife of Cleopas, at the cross. On Sunday, Cleopas is going home with somebody. I think it's reasonable to suggest this is Mary and Cleopas, husband and wife, walking away. Some who are less biblical scholars than I like to point out that the bickering gives it away. <laughs> so Jesus continues to mess with them. He's like, what things? What do you mean? Are you the only one that doesn't know what happened? He's like, what? Uh, tell, me, tell me about it. And they said, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, he was this prophet, he was mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and our rulers, they delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. Here's the key line. But we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped, in other words, he was going to be the one to try to usher in this new age that we had been waiting for. We had hoped. They used the past tense. We had hoped. We don't hope that anymore. It says that they went out. It's the third day since this all happened. In Roman law, you could not issue a death certificate until the third day after someone had died. Just fascinating because the medical care wasn't quite what it is now. So there's a chance you can make a mistake or they're just sleeping really deeply. But by day three, they're like, no, we're pretty sure they're dead. <laughs> but just can't buy an issue certificate. So they're like, it's day three, it's done. There's no way he's just sleeping really deeply. He's really, really dead. 
So the image here, I think, is really important. It's kind of beautiful. If this is a husband or wife, like I think it is, you have this image of this couple walking away from Jerusalem. Well, what's in Jerusalem? The apostles are in Jerusalem, right? Which are, for better or for worse, the fledgling church. That's where the church is, hiding locked in a room. But still, nevertheless, there they are. But the image of this husband and a wife walking away from the church, having been let down, having been disappointed and hurt. It's a powerful image, man. How many people in your lives, maybe you don't know with you, but I sure know a lot of family members and friends who've walked away from the church because they've been hurt or let down or disappointed or, or something else. And the icon of these two embodying that pain is really powerful for me, partially because on the most important day in human history, Jesus chooses to spend his time there. I'm going to go hang out with you that night. That's where I want to go. She's really beautiful. So they go, and they're still talking about it. Well, some, some women went to the tomb, and they said they didn't find his body, but everyone's still confused about it, basically. Um, Jesus responds, and he says, Oh, fools. <laughs> Look at that, that's what he says. Oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning with Moses, which is the Torah, the first five books, and all the prophets, that's everything else. He interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things that concerned him. Does anyone know, according to the teaching of the church, what things in the Old Testament are about Jesus? All of them. <laughs> so what does Jesus explain to these two on the seven-mile journey? You catch that? He explains everything. Seven miles. What does it take to watch seven miles? Three and a half hours? Three hours? I mean, it's a long, a, a three-hour walk with Jesus, where he explains everything. Every question you ever had, everything that's going on in the Old Testament, he opens all of it. The greatest homily on earth. Didn't rip it off anybody. <laughs> <laughs> the best Bible study anyone's ever given, the best talk, right? He lays it all over for three and a half hours, or however long it takes. And do they get it? And they're like, oh, totally, it's you! No. They're still in the dark. Which tells you that the best talk ever doesn't do it. It's not quite enough. The best Bible study, the best homily, those aren't enough. So they get to where they're going, and Jesus seems to be going further. But they can see, literally, it says they held on to him. They're like, no, you can't go, we love you. And he seems to be going further. They're like, it's late. It's getting dark out. It's late. You can't keep going. Come and dine with us. And they go in. And it says, when they were gathered at table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Those are the exact same words that Luke used to describe the Last Supper, a chapter and a half earlier. Took, blessed, broke, gave. Luke knows exactly what he's describing to, and he's describing the Eucharist. By the way, do you guys know this is where the Catholic Church gets the structure of the Mass? Jesus proclaims scriptures, gives a homily about it for three and a half hours. I don't know how long that would last. Gives a homily, and then they gather around the Eucharistic table together. That's the mess, and it's simplest form, right? That's where we get it. And when they eat it, what happens? It says their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Now here's what I want you to think about for a second. Their eyes were opened. What is the first time in the Bible that someone eats something? First time in the Bible, anybody eats anything? Adam and Eve. A husband and a wife who eat something, and what happens to Adam and Eve when they eat that something? Their eyes are opened. Remember that? That's how the Bible begins. That is the presentation of the problem. Every good story has got to have a good problem. The problem is presented on the first pages. At the end of the story, it's the end of the Gospel of Luke, it's the end of the story of the ministry of Jesus. At the other end, what do you have? Another husband and a wife who eat something and their eyes are open. What were Adam and Eve's eyes open to? Death, sin, chaos, corruption. What are Cleopas and Mary's eyes open to? Resurrection, life, reconciliation, redemption. What is it that they ate? Here's the icing on the cake. They ate something that hung from a tree a couple days earlier. Father of the church, I feel right now. 
Scripture has interpreted itself. It has totally opened up the entire narrative, which is cool, and that's exciting, and I want to demonstrate how neat it is to kind of find these connections, but that's not really the point of the story. And those are cool. The point of the story is what they do next. And when they recognize him, their eyes are open, it says they he vanished out of their sight. And I wonder if that's because he actually is within them, his presence in the Eucharist in a different way. And he vanishes, and they say what? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Who does he get to go though? It's getting pretty late. Does anyone know what they do? Not bad. What do they do? They go back. Why did they tell Jesus he couldn't keep going? It's really late, Jesus. The day's over. It's getting dark. So they decided to take the three and a half hour journey back. Isn't that remarkable? It's late. Who they got there like at one in the morning? Can you imagine them banging on the apostles' door? Oh, God, I'm so tired. This is discipleship, guys. This is the reason I love this story. It's because it's the story about realizing that the world is totally different than we thought it was. The realization that God has much more for us than we thought. The world is not what it seemed. And the only proper response to having your eyes open to the reality of Jesus Christ should be, whatever time it is, to run back and do something about it. To tell everyone, which is their only possible response. Last thing I want to say is this. I jumped over what I find the most heart-wrenching part of this story, and this is where I'll close. But as he's going along the road, and as he's explaining everything, actually right before he does, when he calls them fools, he says this line that has haunted me for a couple of years now. And I, I don't mean that hyperbolically, I mean it, it's haunted me. Jesus says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Was it not necessary? Um, I wasn't going to go here, but um, all three of my children, I have three awesome children, just amazing children. They're a little bit ticked off in Toronto tonight, but they'll get over it. I'll be back early tomorrow. But um, all three of them came to us through adoption. Um, beautiful story. We started actually adopting before we knew we could biologically have kids. God took, that, took, took control of that for us. Um, but each of them has come from, adoption's beautiful. It's funny, we tell our, I just was with my wife, we were giving a talk somewhere else in Colorado about the story of how our family came together. And it's funny because infertility is a part of our story, adoption is a part of our story. And it's easy to look at our lives and be like, oh man, everything worked out. Right? You guys couldn't have kids, these kids didn't have family, bing, bam, boom, everything's cool. But that's not how Christianity works. That's not how to say this. That's not how following God's will works, right? Because all three of our kids, I'm so grateful that they're in our lives, and I couldn't imagine life without them. But they each came into the world through pretty profound levels of trauma. And I'm thinking of my son, my middle, my middle child, my son Sam, who has some struggles that I still don't know if I have the capacity to fully deal with as a father. He came into this world through a lot of traumas, and his, his, his birth mom is pretty severely abused when he was in utero. Really intense physical violence that I lie awake at night not knowing how to forgive something like that. And he's got trauma and scars that he's going to carry with him through the rest of his life. And there's been nights, so many more nights than I can even count, that my wife and I have laid awake in bed with tears in our eyes saying, I have no idea how to give our son what he needs. At the end of my rope, you know that line that says, God never gives you more than you can handle? He gives you way more than you can handle so that he can come in and handle the rest of it for you. But if you've ever been in that moment, you're like, I can't do it. I don't have the capacity for this. I don't know where to go. I can't be the father he needs, and I have no idea how to. And I've been in agony. We've come a long way in actually the last year and figuring some stuff for sent out, but, but there's been a lot of sleep inside. But here's, here's where I bring that up. I just don't lie about my family. But for a long time, I believed in a God who was kind of a silver lining God, right? There's all this evil, there's all this terrible stuff in the world, but God will always bring a silver lining out of it, right? God will bring some good out of that bad thing in the end. But guess what? I don't believe in a God like that anymore. 
That is not the kind of God that I would believe in because Jesus is something very different on the road to Emmaus. And I can't fully understand it. But I'm going to trust him because what he says is, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? Not that God kind of has his back turned and he's like, oh shoot, Jesus is being crucified. Why? Don't worry, everybody's going to get out of that. We don't have a silver lining, God. And I hope, and I pray, and I, I hope is the only word because it's theological virtue. I hope that someday I'll stand before God in heaven, I hope. And that I'll have to ask him, why, why did my son have to deal with this stuff? Why, why did that have to happen to him? And I hope that he says something like, Scott, was it not necessary that your son had to deal with that trauma so that he could become the saint that I wanted him to be? Scott, was it not necessary that you and Annie should actually have to work through that so that I could actually make you into the parents that I wanted you to be? Not, yeah, that was terrible, and I realized it kind of too late, and then I, I got some good at it, right? No. No, was it not? God never wills evil, and I know that. And that's why this will be something I'll reflect upon probably for my entire life. God doesn't will evil, but at the same time, he's always there. He doesn't turn his back. He doesn't realize, oh, shoot, I forgot to take care of that. And God can use anything, everything, to bring about his will in the world. Even, even a child who got abused in the Even that. God's going to say, no, do you see what I've done? Do you see what I did with this? That's the God that I want to believe in. And I struggle to do it every single day of my life. But that's the God who's presented to us in the Bible. That's the God who says, no, the world is so much different than what you think it is. Your trials, your struggles, the baggage that you carry with you, I can actually take those things and not wipe them away. No, that's too small. I can glorify them. And I can help you use those things to change the world and change the people around you. That's the world that I want to live in. Not where evil just goes away, but God can say, no, I'm going to conquer the evil, and I'm going to use the baggage that came out of it to show my glory and to bring new life. Let's close there. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, the world of death. Thanks to you guys.